Welcome back. Now, we know we railed on just how bad the Power Glove was, but truth be told, there are some absolutely insane peripherals from the days when Nintendo and Sega were on top. While most people are probably familiar with some of these, such as a classic zapper, John Painter decided to show us some of the more interesting inputs in his collection. Let's have a look. All right, thanks, Steph. So we're back here with John Painter. Now, you might remember him. We, uh, we did a few collection episodes and things like that, and we got a lot of love and hate for our take on the Power Glove. So uh, we wanted to come back here. I know John's got a ton of peripherals, and those are some of the fun, that like, the nostalgia I remember. Right off the bat, the Zapper, man. Now, oh, I had the orange one. Tell me a little bit about how the Zapper worked, because it was actually pretty advanced technology for the time. It definitely was. I actually had the gray one when I was a kid, and uh, what it does is it picks up a light signature. What happens is that when you shoot it, the whole screen flashes black for one frame, and then uh, where the character is on the screen that you're aiming at, uh, lights up white, so the light gun will pick up the signature from it, and it'll count as a hit if it sees the white spot. So I remember like getting right close to the screen and doing so obviously it's a way of cheating, but uh, it sort of works almost like the Wii does, just backwards, kind of. Basically, and what's really cool about it is you could really cheat with it and just point it at a light bulb and it'll always pick up a hit signature. Right, I remember hearing about that. Now, I think everyone remembers Duck Hunt for it, but there were uh, actually quite a few games for the Zapper, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a lot. Uh, one that I remember a lot as a kid was the shooting range game, uh, on top of Duck Hunt, of course. Everyone remembers Duck Hunt. But there's some other cool games too that uh, basically it would be normal you use a controller and then you could uh, use the um, the zapper for different scenes like in The Adventures of Bayou Billy is an example for sure. And uh, you could shoot the guys on the screen with a zapper while you're moving your character. Oh, that's pretty cool. Now, if you had to pick a favorite though, is it, is it gonna be Duck Hunt? It's gotta be Duck Hunt. Fair Absolutely. enough, fair enough. Now, the other thing I remember, I never had one but my buddy did, was the Power Pad. And I remember that track and field game. So. So how many games worked for this and, and sort of what games were they? Were they all sort of running games like that or? Uh, there's a, a lot of running games, uh, but there's some really cool ones too. Like uh, here we have Dance Aerobics and basically it's a, a workout. It's the equivalent today of the, uh, today's We Fit. Uh, on top of that, we also have games like Street Cop where you're an officer and you try to capture criminals. And that was really cool because you had to use the power pad as a controller to move the police officer around. Uh, there's other games as well, such as uh, Short Order and Explode. And uh, they're more of like a uh, like a gopher game, and you also have to like build hamburgers. It's kind of like uh, Diner Dash. Now I remember playing the track and field game, and and I'm probably not the only one that did this, but you cheated, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. So that was you use the hands, and then when the long jump came, you just let go. Let go, yeah. Let your hands go. And jump forever. Yeah. Now we're gonna skip the classic one for now. We're gonna come back to this, but. Uh, you actually told me you had this, and I had to go look it up because I didn't remember at all what this was. But the U-Force, can you can you describe it at all? Oh yeah, it, it's kind of neat because it works with all the games. But again, like the Power uh, Glove that we talked about before, it does have a lot of faults. A lot of games don't really work properly with it. Um, but certain games do work pretty decent. Uh, one of them, for example, with Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, it actually has a bar specifically for Mike Tyson's Punch-Out and it allows the signature to be picked up in the power field of you hitting. So what you do is you actually put your hands inside this and that sort of registers like a, an input on the game? Absolutely. Uh, the other one that kind of works neat too is this joystick here that works really well with Top Gun and it basically sits into place and you can control the plane using this. Uh, and then it's wireless of course, which is weird, there's no electronics at all. It picks up the signatures from the buttons as shots. Now we were actually looking at this too before, and this sort of works the same way like the the zapper did, where it's got like the white the white sort of thing that will actually pick up the sense. That's kind of cool. Um, now works well, I guess, is sort of a, an overstatement on this. I heard it wasn't that great. No, it, it works better than the Power Glove, but it, it doesn't doesn't it definitely does not have the functionality of the zapper or other products like the Power Pad. This actually works. Both these work great. Now. We left the sort of the most iconic thing of the Nintendo for last was Rob, and this really doesn't look like a controller at all. What what does this do? This was really cool, actually. Uh, Rob came out with the release of the Nintendo in 1985. He's basically what brought back video games to North America after the crash in 1983. Uh, at the time, a lot of big box stores didn't want to have uh, video games in because basically there was no market for them. So what Nintendo did was put the robot in with the system and market it as a toy with the gun. And it came with a packing game, which was Gyromite, and uh, Duck Hunt. So when they came together, they sold it as a toy instead of a video game. So stores thought it was much better, and uh, that's actually basically what brought back video games from the dead. Now, how does it actually work? I remember there being like tops and things like that, and the robot would actually go and move them. Is that how it sort of worked? Or Yeah, basically what we'd do is in Gyromite, uh, in game A, you'd hit select, 
or the start button rather, and he, uh, the gyro would be spinning on here, and you could input the commands of how you wanted him to, uh, what you wanted him to do, whether you wanted him to put it on the uh, blue or red switch. I actually don't have that connection piece or the uh, gyros, but uh, that's how that one would work. And for stack up, he had other accessories that allowed him, uh, it would give you an image on the screen, and he had a stack of the blocks according to how the picture on the screen was. Now, all of these peripherals, I definitely remember them there being a ton more, and it was a, a much more common thing for the older generation. And really, other than Rock Band, you don't see that anymore. Why do you think that is? Do you think that you know we're just not as creative with it, or is there something else to it? I think what the main thing is now is that uh, with controllers, they're just so they work so much better than they used to. They're a lot more buttons. Uh, you can pretty much do anything you want to do with that, so you don't need all these peripherals to do everything. Uh, Rock Band and Guitar Hero did something that no one else has been able to do and actually make the peripherals work exactly how it was intended to be. Where a lot of ones that come out now aren't quite like that. Uh, everything they intend for them to do just doesn't quite work properly and just not as expected. Well John, as always, thanks for showing us your collection. Obviously you got a lot of great stuff here and it was fun to remember the better peripherals. The, the better ones for sure, yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. No problem, thanks. Welcome everybody, I'm Yazid. I'm usually behind the camera, but today I'm sitting down with two special guests and we're going to have a, a pretty exciting Mobonomics kind of roundtable discussion. So, uh, joining us today are two resident Mobonomics teachers, uh, Ian and Blake. Thank you guys for coming. No problem. My pleasure. Well, let's kick it off with a very simple question. Let's just find out more about you guys. So, uh, Ian, can you tell us a little bit about your MOBA background? For sure, yeah. I actually had two starts to my Dota lifestyle it's now. Um, first I was back in 2004 before the game had Roshan, before it had any kind of update system, didn't even have a forum yet. And then I, I, I accidentally got into that game and then basically I didn't know what was going on, didn't quite like it. And then I had a start, another start a year later when Ice Rock took up the development and we had the TDA community, TDA ban list, all those things in there. And that's when I actually liked the game and from there I've been playing it for many many hours. I'm not gonna actually name the number but it's pretty up there in terms of um, in terms of what I like now, I've played through Heroes of New Earth, I've played through League of Legends, great games, but didn't, they don't quite fit me in my, my uh, vision. So I definitely like Dota 2 now, Valus. Dota 2 is probably the best MOBA out there. So Excellent. what about you? What about you, Blake? Um, I started off with League of Legends, the only one that Ian didn't really take to. Uh, I started playing LoL right after I was done with my World of Warcraft spree because I had to choose between LoL and Han, and I didn't have $15, so I went with League of Legends. And uh, I spent a lot of time in LoL. Uh, I played it for a couple of years and dabbled a bit in playing it seriously with some friends on the team. But um, after I got my Dota 2 invite in, I want to say, April of last year, I moved into Dota both casually and on a more professional level. I got involved with a lot of North American leagues, including uh, the Collegiate Dota League and uh, Fiber Up Gaming League more recently. So. Um, within both the casual and professional setting, I do prefer Dota 2. Excellent. So we have three Dota fanboys here, I myself actually. Absolutely unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we get the round table to be as uh, equal uh, we'll opportunist we'll as we'll possible. Yeah. But uh, so let's, uh, let's go off to the next question. Uh, we're going to talk about the accessibility of MOBA. I mean, it, it is a very high learning curve. Uh, what do you guys feel about, you know, just the, the community in terms of how friendly they are to, and the game itself to new players? What do you think, uh, Blake? You can start. Well, whenever I, I, like I said, I can't really speak on Han, but whenever I compare League of Legends and Dota, I always use this distinction in terms of the way the communities act, is that League of Legends, everybody is very uptight and they know what they're talking about and they're very particular about correcting you when you make a mistake. In Dota, it's people who don't speak your language screaming at you in all caps. So really, it's your pick of the litter in terms of what you want. But uh, in terms of accessibility for new players, I do have to say League of Legends is better in that respect. Not just because people will tell you exactly what you're doing wrong, mind you, but Dota doesn't even have a completely fleshed out tutorial yet. Uh, there's still only one map that teaches you the basics, whereas League of Legends does have better tutorial options right now, as well as a bit more fleshed out bots, as well as different game modes for you to try if you're not ready for the 5v5. So I will say League of Legends has a bit of a head start for new players. Yeah, what do you think, Ian? Well, first I'm going to say Dota is in beta stage right now, as of okay. today. So that's the first start. But in terms of accessibility, definitely one of the toughest genres to get into in terms of a learning curve. I wouldn't even call it a curve. I would say just a wall that you just hit, and then most people don't even make it past the wall. But in terms of accessibility, I would say Han perhaps has the best tutorial and they went the smart way because I think tutorials and accessibility shouldn't be starting 
from exactly having the tutorial map or game or explanation, that's great. But I think one of the best things to have is having a mentorship system. And that's what Han focused on. They established a mentorship system, which allows, and they're working on that, it's not finalized yet, but I think that's the direction they should be heading into because nothing beats having a human mentor telling you what are you doing wrong exactly or somebody to spectate and learn from as well as get rewards and points and skins and whatever you're into. So I think that's the direction and Han takes the cake on that one for me, but Dota is up there. Let's talk about the competitive scene. So the mobile competitive scene, uh, what do you, you know, what do you like the most about the big threes scene? So for example, what is Dota doing that you like more than League of Legends? What is Han doing or lacking rather? So what do you think, uh, Blake? Dota and LoL are both taking very different approaches and it's hard to assess because both have their positives and their negatives and they're on the opposite side of the spectrum. You have League of Legends where Riot Games has completely taken control of their competitive scene, funded it, funded teams, and they run their own tournaments with high production value. They ship all the teams out to California to play and that's really good. Like, Riot's putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into producing their competitive scene by themselves. But you also come into a problem on two sides. The first is that it's really hard for amateurs to break into the scene. Because if you're not a part of the direct main LCS tournament that Riot puts on, you're essentially worthless. And nobody else wants to run tournaments because the LCS dominates the scene. And then you have Dota, where it's completely different. Valve doesn't put any money into it except having one major tournament in the international. And they spread out attention even within the international through different studios. Like they'll outsource qualifiers that they won't run themselves through their own streams, but they outsource it to studios like the Good Studio and Beyond the Summit. So they really support other people who want to get involved in the professional scene outside of their company, but it makes the scene less stable. So there are positives to both ways that you wanna go, but if you're looking to break into the scene, it's easier to do so in Dota. If you're already established in the scene, financially, you're more secure in League of Legends. What do you think, Ian? I'm gonna take the easy way route right now. Uh, it, I agree with Blake in terms of League of Legends and Dota differences. I'm gonna weigh in on Han because I think that's something both games can learn from. Mm -hmm. Han did something right. They did, and that goes with your, what you said in terms of accessibility from, uh, for the amateur scene, yeah. not the professional. They did Han Tour, which is essentially, it's a low, um, low prize pool, so it's not something you know huge, but in terms of it's very regular, and anyone can do it based on your rank or your league you're playing in. If you're bronze league, if you're silver league, your gold league, you can make it and you can try it and you can keep trying every two, three weeks. That's something that you know mobile gamers, they do, they play a lot of games. So yeah. if you have a tournament that only happens once a year or only have ones that are like in California where actually most players are not even geographically not even in there. <laughs> so um, in terms of that, I think Han did it right. They're making the game approachable and the, the uh, competitive scene, they're making it competitive in the right direction. They're focusing the regular player, not the professional scale, because the professional scale will always thrive if the game is popular. But what you need to focus on is the actual gamer that you have, you know, the regular average one. Do you guys think Steam is an advantage for Dota 2 or is it a hurdle? So can you talk a little bit about that, Blake? It's definitely an advantage. There's a lot of stuff that Steam, Steam and only Steam integrates in the gaming community right now. The workshop for user-created content, trading items through various different games as well as the games themselves. It opens up a lot of stuff outside of the game f just for the community aspect because everybody has Steam. So anybody who wants to join up Dota can join up for free once it's released. It'll be integrated through Steam, trade all your items, vote on new stuff to get in there. It's really easy and everybody already has it. Yeah, pretty handy. In terms of what I know personally, is that people don't like installing things in their computer that are outside what they need to actually play the game. So in terms of Steam accessibility, but that doesn't have to do anything with Dota, people, it, I think it's, it's a hurdle for a little bit in terms of people don't like that. They don't want to access it. But in terms of League of Legends, it has something over Steam. It just, you go on the site, download the game, you play. That's it, you just have to make an account. So it has that, yeah. the starter bump, but then I think in the long run, Steam definitely takes over. Yeah, no, great, great answers, guys. So uh, let's, talk, let's get to the last question. This one's kind of a little out there, but I thought it'd be great to ask. So do you think the other genres, like role-playing games and first-person shooters and MMOs, do you think they can learn and improve from MOBA and what MOBA has kind of brought to the table? Ian, do you want to? Yeah, I kind of have a hopefully an okay answer for this uh, and not to be kind of a PC gamer and mentality of it, but I think the biggest lesson developers can take away from the MOBA genre being so popular and growing every day, I mean, that we can definitely see that by the competitive scene, by the, all the launches that we're having and the diversity of MOBA games, is that developers shouldn't be afraid of making hard games. The learning curve, as long as the game is balanced, as long as it's reasonably hard, not just kind of artificial difficulty, but in terms of actual skill level, people will pick up the game and the game will survive in the long run. 
So I think that, that it's just kind of a little little flag for the developers is don't be afraid of making hard games. That's that's a good point that they should learn. But in terms of obviously what the game does as a genre, I think just like role playing games eventually kind of spread to every other genre. We have leveling systems of person shooters that we covered last episode, but it's essentially, yeah, of course, they can learn. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Good points, good points. I think um, the biggest thing for me is both support for the competitive scene and features outside of the game itself are the biggest thing for me. I mean, you look at the community like the fighting game community, it's a really popular community, but the games have very little in terms of solid competitive support. Like Marvel vs. Capcom 3, for example, doesn't have replays. Just basic stuff like that, MOBA really showcases how much of a powerhouse esports in general can be. And I think when developers are approaching developing a game, they need to take into consideration, can this game be played competitively? Will it be played competitively? And they, they need to add in features that are basically a staple, like replays, spectator, all that kind of stuff into Price. whatever games they're developing. Prizes too, yeah. <laughs> So I'd love to see more developers get really passionate about their competitive scene. Great points, guys. I mean, I love the free-to-play model and, and kind of getting the... I, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. There's, there's just so much that MOBA can offer. So uh, thank you guys for an awesome roundtable. You know, that's a wrap for us today. Uh, make sure to tune in next episode where uh, Stephanie plays in the Mobanomics finale and she actually plays Dota 2 for the first time. And let's just say she might uh, rage a little bit and uh, smash a keyboard or two. So until next time. Coming up, Evo Land is a game that takes you on an interesting journey through video game evolution, and Adam's going to tell you if it's worth the trip. Stay tuned.